The 15th of October 1946 was the last day of Hermann Göring's life. He had received a death sentence at the Nuremberg trial of major war criminals and that sentence was to be carried out in the early hours of the next day. In this video, I shall examine what he did in his last few hours. The prisoners, in theory, did not know when they were to be executed. No date was specified. The first date possible was indeed the early hours of the 16th of October 1946, and that date was chosen to get it over with as quickly as possible. However, in practice, the prisoners probably knew that the execution was to take place. The trucks bringing in the materials to build the scaffolds had driven into the prison yard on the 13th of October 1946 and the gallows equipment had been erected in the guards' gymnasium. The prison guards had continued to play their usual basketball while the scaffolds were erected in an effort to stifle the sound of the construction, although I doubt if this fooled anyone. 22 men had been tried at Nuremberg. One, Martin Bormann, had not yet been apprehended. As it turned out, that would have been rather difficult, as he was dead. Of the 21 left, three had been found not guilty and released. That leaves 18, seven had been sentenced to prison, and 11 to death. The prisoners were housed in a cell block next to one another. The doors to their cells did not have locks with keys, but were bolted shut. There was a large barred window in each of the doors. Not a peephole, as is often said, but a window. This could be shut from the outside, which allowed the guards to keep an eye on the prisoners. The bolt was too far down the door to allow a prisoner to reach down to it. Initially, there was one guard to four prisoners, but following the suicide of Robert Lay, there was one guard to one prisoner. The prisoners, therefore, could be watched from this window permanently. In the cell, there was a toilet which was recessed, which allowed some privacy, but of course, the guards could shout at the prisoners to hurry up when they were there. Robert Lay formerly head of the Reich Labour Association, had killed himself in the toilet recess on the 25th of October 1945, three days after receiving his indictment. Fritz Saukel, the former Reich plenipotentiary for labour deployment, had not reacted well to his death sentence. He could be heard throughout the cell block screaming loudly, something he had not bothered to do when his victims were press-ganged into slavery, many of them to be brutally treated in concentration camps from which they never returned. On the evening of the 14th of October 1946, Goering asked the prison chaplain, Reverend Henry Fred Gerecker, if he knew when the executions were to take place. Gerecker said he did not, and Goering requested Holy Communion. Gerecke was an American of German extraction, born in 1892. His job at Nuremberg was to look after the spiritual requirements of the Lutheran prisoners, whilst Father Sixtus O'Connor, also from the US but speaking fluent German, took care of the Catholics. Gerecke explained his subsequent actions a few days later. I refused him the Lord's Supper because he denied the divinity of Christ, who instituted this sacrament. He became more discouraged because I insisted he couldn't meet Edda, his daughter, in heaven if he refused the Lord's way of salvation. At 8.30 in the morning of the 15th of October 1946, the prison doctor, Ludwig Flücke, took Goering's pulse in the presence of an American guard. They talked for around 10 minutes, 
Goering read something to the doctor which the guard could not understand as it was in German, but both the doctor and the prisoner laughed. An hour or so later, the prison barber came in and gave Goering a shave. Shaving implements not being permitted to the prisoners as they were potential suicide risks. Goering requested a book from the library and writing materials which were brought to him by a prison trustee at 1530. The book was on birds migrating to Africa. Fifteen minutes later, he was writing something when someone from the kitchen staff brought him a mug of tea. After his death, three letters were found in his cell. Presumably, these letters were now being authored. He would, of course, have had to be careful about what he wrote and how he did it. His cell could have been searched, his communications read, and this could have led to the cyanide pill with which he intended to kill himself being discovered. However, there was an important lack of security in one area. The guards could not speak German. The military commander of the prison, Colonel Burton Andrus, informed Dr. Fluker in the afternoon that the condemned men were to be awakened at 23.45, notified that their execution was imminent, and offered something to eat. Perhaps he thought that being notified of impending death would build up an appetite. Dr. Pfluker was doing his usual rounds in the early evening and gave Goering a white pill and put a small white envelope on the table. Each night, the doctor provided the inmates with a sedative to help them sleep. The guard at the door saw Goering feel inside the envelope, then poured some white powder from it into his tea. The assumption later from this gesture was that he was looking for something inside the envelope, or maybe that assumption only came with hindsight. As night fell, most of the lights were turned on, which was unusual. This must have confirmed to everyone that the executions were about to take place. Gereke popped into Goering's cell at 1930. Goering complained to him that he had not been permitted to see Fritz Saukel, who was still having a really bad time. The conversation turned to that of the hanging, a form of execution Goering thought to be most dishonourable, although of course he had not hesitated to use it, and worse forms of killing for that matter, when it suited him. The minister asked him to completely surrender his heart and soul to what he termed his saviour. Whereas Goering said he was a Christian, he stated that he could not accept the teachings of Christ. He concluded the conversation, stating that he hoped he'd be able to get some rest during the evening. At 20.30, Private First Class Gordon Bingham took up his post at Goering's door, keeping an eye on him. Goering was then lying on his bed, wearing his boots, trousers and coat, reading the book on the migratory birds. At around 20.50, Goering went to the toilet, urinated and took off his boots, changing into his slippers. He tidied the cell and put on his pyjamas, which were pale blue jacket and black silk trousers. He then lay down, pulled up the military blankets to his waist, and it seemed as though he were asleep. He had left his clothes and papers in neat piles. Prison rules stated that both arms needed to be outside the blanket whilst the prisoner was asleep. At 21.05, Dr. Fluker made his third round, but did not come to see Goering. He told the guard that he would visit him later. Eight reporters were allowed to watch the executions, and they were permitted to see the prisoners through the windows in the doors around this time. At 21.30, Dr. Fluker returned with sleeping pills for Goering and Saukel. Saukel got a sleeping pill, but the doctor had filled Goering's not with the usual sedative, but instead with baking soda. He stated later that he had not wanted Goering to have to be awakened for his execution. 
When Fluker entered the cell, he was escorted by the duty officer, First Lieutenant Arthur J. McLinden. Goering spoke quietly with the doctor for around three minutes. Goering told him, or so the doctor later said, that the executions were to take place that night. The doctor handed over a pill, which Goering put in his mouth immediately. The doctor took Goering's pulse. On leaving, he shook hands with Goering, something he had never done before. Goering lay still on his bed. Lieutenant Dow looked in. It appeared to him that Goering was asleep. At around 22.30, the six-man hanging team walked into the gymnasium. The guard at Goering's door was changed to Private First Class Harold F. Johnson. Goering lay still until 22.40. Now I'm going to quote the testimony of Johnson. He brought his hands across his chest with fingers laced and turned his head to the wall. He lay that way for around two to three minutes, then placed his hands back along his sides. That was at 10.44 p.m. exactly. I looked at my watch to check the time. That was the moment when Goering bit into the glass ampoule containing the cyanide, which killed him in a few seconds. In future videos, I shall examine where Goering might have obtained the poison with which he killed himself. I hope you found that interesting, although you may be somewhat frustrated by me not providing the answers that you may have wanted to hear. The fact is that the answer you want to hear is not known to history. William Glennie, who was then an 18-year-old guard at Nuremberg, stated in 2008 that one of four people may have given Goering the cyanide one German and three Americans, but he didn't want to name any names. Well, the one German is quite obvious who he's referring to. It must be the doctor, Ludwig Fluke. The three Americans, well, unfortunately, I only know the name of one of the three who he may have been thinking of. Anyway, I'll try and do that in a future video. So, uh, if you want to know when that's going to be published, then uh, you could subscribe and then you will be informed of when it is online. And if you attend the premiere, you will be able to chat in real time with me and other viewers about this and anything else that comes to your mind. Thanks for listening.